Hello and welcome to Military Mantra. In this interview, we have today Sean Buck Rogers, a former Green Beret, an ultra marathoner, an author, and also a founder of FNG Academy. And in this interview, we'll be discussing with him his life in the armed forces and various life lessons that he has learned over his service. So thanks, Sean, for coming here and taking time out to share your story with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Man. It's good talking to you. So, Sean, if you could tell us, you know, uh, how was your life before joining the military? And, you know, what was your motivation back then? Well, before I joined the military, life was life was pretty rough for me. Uh, I grew up in, you know, a trailer. Um, my mom was uh, had a lot of issues. My dad was gone. Um, so a lot of in and out of trouble for me. And then trying to, you know, find my own way and figure out what I was going to do with my life. Um, so I, I really spent a lot of time just trying a lot of different things and, and hoping one of them was going to work. I didn't really ever intend on joining the military. Um, it was really a last resort thing for me because I ended up, I wanted to be a firefighter and then I was in uh, EMT school and then I'm getting a fight. I got kicked out of EMT school and I was, I joined the military to hope that they would, you know, give me some, uh, balance and some structure to my life. So it was kind of a, you know, like a last minute Hail Mary, hopeful, you know, thing. It wasn't something that I really planned on doing. Okay. So if you could also speak about, you know, how did that journey look like? Because you're a Greenberry. So how was that whole process of becoming a Greenberry for you? Uh, the process was, it, it was pretty terrifying because first of all, you, you're, you, you don't know if you're good enough. You don't know if you can make it. You don't know anything. All you know is that in your mind, these special operations guys are, you know, they're bigger than life. They're the toughest, they're the meanest. Um, and they're probably, you know, way stronger, way more powerful than you, way faster than you. So you, you just put them on this big pedestal. So um, going into the process was just a lot of insecurity. And then I was already insecure about the way I grew up as it was, because I didn't have, you know, wasn't, wasn't educated. Um, I had to seek out my own degrees just to kind of counter the uh, insecurities that I felt from not having an education. Um, and I was surrounded by people that were just highly intellectuals, you know, and accomplished people. So I just felt really, you know, behind the curve and I kind of felt like I was out of my element. So definitely some imposter syndrome going on through um, the process, but um, overall each phase, you know, passing because it's such a long process, you know, from SFAS, you go to selection, you got three weeks, just them telling you like, Hey, you got selected. That was a huge deal for me for someone that didn't have any confidence. And I didn't know if I was capable for them to tell me that I was capable meant the world to me. So that was a huge, huge uh, thing for me. And then each phase of passing, it just kind of started to build my confidence in myself a little bit more. And so I was, I was kind of seeking uh, these green berets out as, as mentors and as guides and every time they gave me a thumbs up, it, it meant, probably meant more to me than most people. Got it. So if you could also tell us, you know, uh, what are the qualities that they look in when they select you? So is it more physical or is it more of a mental thing? I think it's, it's definitely the physical part should already be there. So kind of physical is um, out the hopefully not even being worried about by the time you're into selection and into team week. Um, so all the physical gates, they kind of, you know, weed the people out that didn't show up physically prepared. Ideally, everybody shows up to selection physically prepared. So that way they could focus on the other aspects of what they're looking for. So, um, you know, how do you work in a team? How do you handle pressure? Uh, do you, are you the guy that, uh, or girl now that, you know, snaps at other people when they get upset or do you work together to, to, to find the solution so you know how do you start acting when the, the pressure's on and that's really what they want to look for mm -hmm. but unfortunately people still show up not physically in shape um, so they have to go through a weeding process of getting them out and then that way they could start focusing on people um, you know their mentalities their personalities and how would they fit for a team because at the end of the day, a team is just a small group of people that have to operate together and get along. So if you're not an easy person to get along with, or you don't, you don't work well on a team, that's really what they're looking for. 
got it so ishan if you could also speak about you know uh, how was your first experience when you went into your battalion in greenberry so how was that experience for you yeah that was that was kind of uh, love hate cuz i was so happy to be there but at the same time you know that you're going to have new guy time uh, and you know that you're going to get treated like a new guy and i went in my experience was a little different cuz the guys um were deployed to africa when i got there so nobody was there all the teams were gone um so the only people were in the in the company was the b team so i went to the the b team where you know people that are transitioning off teams they go or if you're too senior you've had too much team time you'll go spend on the b team so i went there and i'm doing my new guy time so i'm sweeping the floors i'm keeping my mouth shut i'm i'm getting everyone food you know and that was like 3 months um and then i the teams finally got back and so then i got to go to a team well all that 3 months didn't count because i wasn't a new guy on their team so then my new guy time started over um and that so unfortunately my new guy time lasted probably longer than it needed to uh so i didn't enjoy my b team experience but that also helped me to appreciate it more when i got to an oda so i was like, super excited to be there and to just you know soak up anything and um really there's just a room so full of knowledge and experience that you just want to go in and you just sponge everything and you're trying to figure out where your place is going to be you know who you're going to really get along with who's going to teach you who's just going to expect you to know um so it's a lot of just figuring out other people you know that's kind of your introduction to being on a team got it got it uh, so i also know about you know your call sign was buck so how, how did that yeah. go so when i first got to the team uh, i walked in and i was nervous you know i'm trying to be respectful and in uh i asked who the team sergeant was and everyone in the team is just ignoring me at this point and uh, so i'm just kind of standing there like an idiot and finally that someone looks up the the medic on the team looks up and goes you're looking for him and i walked up to the guy he's sitting at his computer he wouldn't even look at me and i was standing at parade rest and i said i was like hey master sergeant uh, it's nice to meet you i'm the new bravo on the team and he's just like he's like huh, what's your name like he could care less about me and i was like my name's Sean Rogers and he goes Rogers huh like buck rogers and i was like uh i guess i mean yeah like buck rogers <laughs> So ever since then everyone on the team just called me buck uh because i made the i made the cardinal rule of you know showing them that i didn't like the nickname and once you show them you don't like it it's <laughs> that's it it's stuck so that every since then it was hey buck come here hey buck this hey buck that and um you know how nicknames are they go from make a fun of you to a term of endearment so and i was i stuck with it got it so shawn if you could also speak about you know the uh, first combat experience that you had Also, if you could describe the role of Green Berets uh, in the U.S. Army. Yeah. So, the first combat experience I had, um, well, that one, there was two one. So basically, we were uh, there's two sister teams, and they were operating at the front lines of an ISIS valley, and it was kind of rough because they were out front of us, and they got to go first um, because then we were going to come up and we were going to play support. and then we were going to piggyback so we or i'm sorry uh, bound so their team would hold the line and then we would push past them and then we would take the assault and then they would take the assault so my first experience was sitting in uh, a compound just listening to my you know another team get after it i mean it's just gunfire going off like crazy and it it sounds like they're just laying waste you know and we just had to sit there and wait and wait and wait and then finally they called for a resupply and that was our chance so we got it to um my team sergeant was like all right who wants to go and i was like i'm in and so we jumped in the m razers um which is no armor you know they're just little doom buggies and we threw in some ammo we threw in some uh some water some supplies for them and here we go and so we took off to the front line where their assault was already happening and i just see a mortar round like hit and uh, it's afghan commando that was on you know he was probably like 100 meters away it hit right next to him and it just he was like wobbling okay and we could hear the round zip and i was like man this is it this is we're about to do it and uh so i just linked up with the team and they were like they're that way and we just started you know letting rounds fly and 
um, that I realized like at that first experience was so fun because it was all the good stuff, you know, no one got hurt. Uh, we're shooting back where it's, it's all the, the positive things of the things that you want to be in a gunfight two way range, you know, you're, you're not hitting them, but they're not hitting you. You're just, it's like a, a, a child's game at this point. Um, it wasn't until later, you know, when the reality of war sits in, when you're, you're seeing the enemy that you've killed and then you're losing your own guys. That's when, you know, the real kind of the game went away and the reality of war started to set in. Got it. I have one more question because I see a lot of special forces, you know, they train well. So do you think Mm -hmm. the amount of training that you do actually helps you in combat or every combat is actually a very different situation? So what's your opinion? Oh, that's a good question. So I think for sure the training helps because um, it gets to a point where I know what the person next to me is capable of. I know what his thought process process is going to be. I know, you know, what I am going to do so we can rely on each other is because we have such a a strong uh, training background that it's, it becomes predictable for each other. And then not only that, but I know him personally. So I know that, you know, this is how we're trained. But I also know that soldier and what he's going to do. And I, I've seen this guy train, you know, 24 hours straight. And when you start doing CQB for 24 hours straight, you know, people's personality really start to show uh, what happens when they get tired, how they, you know, um, deal with the pressure and, and all that stuff and the fatigue. So the training allows us to kind of predict, you know, what the, everyone's going to do around them. And it helps us to make better decisions um you know without the training if you were just trying to uh react and you were that was your primary plan was to just react and see what happens uh i think the fear would overwhelm there's going to be a point when the fear overwhelms you and you you fail to act because you can't just fall back on all the training and just do what you're supposed to do because i don't care how tough you are there's going to be a moment when you're losing a gunfight you're in a bad position and they have a better position on you and it's terrifying, you know, and I, I I had a high of being in really good positions and always seeming to have the upper hand. And so I was like, war is great. It's easy. I I'm, I'm better trained. So therefore I'm always going to be in a better position. And then I got the experience of being in a worse position and where they had the advantage on me. And it's like, Oh man, this is, this is terrifying. And it's, Mm. it's a horrible thing feeling and that's when the training kicks in it's, it's easy to be on the winning side as well got it got it so sean if you could also speak about you know among the all the combats that you have gone through the most difficult which which you have experienced and how did you actually come out of it uh so the most difficult thing that happened for me personally was i had a i made a poor decision when i had a 320 grenade launcher on my side um and I, I makeshifted a, a holster for it, which is going to run through the trigger guard. And somebody told my senior told me at the time, he said, Hey, you don't think that's a bad idea having to go through trigger guard. I said, no, I'm going to, I'm not going to load it. So it'll be fine. And we ended up taking contact. So I loaded it. And right as I was about to shoot it, uh, our Charlie, or I'm sorry, the echo was like, Hey, let's move positions. He's over here. And then, so I linked it back up. So as I was getting pulled up a wall, it slid down the side and it, sh- it pulled on the cord I had going through the trigger guard and it fired the 320. So I almost blew my leg off with the 320. Um, and that experience was horrific for me because I'm like, I almost hurt myself, almost hurt everybody else. I almost had to, you know, uh, get an evac started for me because of stupidity. Mm. And so that just, depleted my confidence and and to have your confidence depleted mid combat is a really, really awful situation to be in because you're relying so much on the fact that you are really well-trained and you're supposed to be, you know, the subject matter expert and you're going to win through your experience. And, uh, that one, that was rough mentally for me that that I probably suffered from, from that experience per, for at least a year of until I finally accepted that, you know, shit happens and it's going to, I just got to move on. Got it. Uh, so if you could also speak about, you know, uh, because in combat leadership is very important. So how do you look at leadership and how, how did, you know, the lot of training and combat experience help you become a better leader? 
Yeah, so I think, uh, and I, I ended up getting a master's degree in organiz organizational leadership too. So I, I kind of saw the the schoolhouse side, and then I saw the war side of of leadership. So to me, it's like um, I think leadership is just summed up in in caring about the people that you lead, uh, and then but also knowing that as a leader, your job isn't to tell people what to do. Your job isn't to be a dictator. Your job is to be a conduit for everybody else. So if I could, if I have to take a leadership position and I have a good team, my, my primary focus is going to be to analyze that team for their strengths and then be a conduit for those strengths. So each person on that team, especially on ODA, could easily be the leader. Mm. But once you're in that leadership position, your job is to just allow others to be the best versions of themselves and to play on their strengths. So for me, what I learned is that leadership is all about understanding who you're leading, how they best operate, how, what makes them, you know, uh, the most motivated, what, what do they like to do, and then allow them to do those things. Uh, and then you are just the conduit to, to keep that going, uh, you know, and to give overall guidance. So you step out of your focus of whatever my thing is and the thing I'm really good at. As a leader, I step out of that focus and now I get to just look at the overall umbrella and kind of help guide people who are really good at what they do. So I always, for me, I always look at leadership as just finding the strengths in other people and just pushing them forward. Got it, got it. Uh, so, Sean, if you could also speak about, you know, because you were motivated to join the special forces. So was there any experience that you had and you thought, you know, this is why I am in special forces and this is what I wanted to experience. Has that ever happened to you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So like all the all the train up, uh, there was times just blowing demo, uh, breaching doors, you know, CQB to where uh, uh, we've had multi cells multi-breach points so one location you got a breach point here a breach point two teams flowing into the same building at the same time with live ammunition um, doing demo charges at the same time and then being able to flow in like that safely uh, and know that that team isn't going to shoot me i'm not going to shoot them we're we're trained well enough to be able to do stuff like that when i started to do that stuff with the teams even in training i knew that this i loved it i was like this is the place for me i am absolutely in heaven so those moments when you're really operating and you're really doing very very dangerous things just in training alone mm -hmm. that that's when i knew that you know the level of trust um and the level of you know security is like the reg army's here with the trust you know the lower you go the less trust because you're, mm -hmm. you're trying to corral so many people but, but once that jump came to where SF was like, hey, be safe, train the, you know, the most effectively as you can, as safely as possible. But the, the training wheels were off, so to speak. I was, I was really lit up. It was the best experience. and I loved it. Got it. Uh, so Green Berets are also paratroopers. So you also had experience of paratrooping from the aircraft. So if you could uh, yeah. tell me, you know, how was your first experience when you jumped out of an aircraft? How did it feel like for you? I didn't want to do it. I, 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 the, I mean, I, the free fall, you know, the halo was a blast. I absolutely love that. But the static line terrified me. The, I hated, I hated, I never liked static line. There was never a point when I enjoyed it. I never wanted to do it. Um, my entire career, I avoided it at all costs because the, you just land so rough. But the first experience, I'll never forget just seeing the door open. And I, I was just hopeful that there would be some issue with the aircraft and they were going to turn around and just go back to the ground. Um, and then finally we were in the air and it was a, it was a door jump instead of a rear uh, tailgate jump. So, you know, the guy's looking out and he looks out the jump master and then he says, go. And I was like, this isn't happening. And the guys start moving forward and they, they have a, a cadence that they sing in, in airborne school about your, your knees shaking and sure enough, my knees started doing the wobble and the guy in front of me just disappears. And I was like, oh, my God. I was like, oh, this is insane. And so I just did it and I, I stepped out and the feeling was in it was insane because it was a C-130 door jump. So as you step out, you just get launched to the side and then you're just like in this wind 
draft tunnel where you have no idea what's going on. My eyes are closed. I'm doing my Mississippi counts to, uh-huh. to see when the parachute's supposed to open. Um, it feels like it's taking longer than it should for the parachute to pop. And, uh, and then it's, it's just this insanely intense few seconds of, you, you know, hoping that your parachute opens. And then the crazy thing is the difference between that and then once your parachute opens, you're just so calm. All of a sudden, everything stops and it's like pause and you're slowly floating in the air and it's like, oh, okay. So it goes from, you know, 100 miles an hour to one and you're just sitting there floating. You're like, okay, I'm safe. And then you don't worry about anything again until you're right above the ground and then you start panicking that you're going to break your ankles. But I did not like, <laughs> I did not like airborne school. Got it. Uh, or jumping. So she- yeah. Sean, I have one more question. Uh, so you train with the Green Berets uh, when, when you're at your location, but when you go in combat, you also get attached to other commandos. So how do you quickly gel with them, understand and, you know, operate? How, how do you do that? So that's a, that's a great question. So one of the, one of the things that's really important for Green Berets to do is to, to get to know their commandos a little bit before you go out of combat together. Unfortunately, it's not always possible. Sometimes you get thrown right in and, mm. and it's, you got to go, get in combat but ideally you'll take some of those guys out and you'll do you'll do training with them so you're going to do cqb uh flat range especially as the bravo um my job was to do flat range and make sure they're they know how to shoot their weapon systems that they're accurate um, and coach them so on the range like that is your chance to see who's really trying to be good who's trying to you know um become a better shooter and who just wants to go sit in the shade and uh, who's really terrible at shooting. Um, so you, you're, it's your chance to get to know them a little bit. So that way, once you get to combat, um, you're not just guessing and, and, you know, finding out who they are for the first time. But unfortunately, there were so many commandos and they would switch out. You know, they're in war all, the, all year long. Every year for them was just combat. So, um, you know, their companies would switch out and it would be new guys and it was tough because sometimes it would just be me, the only Green Beret with, you know, 15, 20 commandos. And then all the other Green Berets on my team have their own group of commandos and they're doing separate operations at the same time. Um, and you have a variety of commandos. It, it ranged from, you know, amazing, high quality, uh, truly special operations guys, all the way to guys that had wanted nothing to do with war. They didn't even you know, I, I put a guy on a, a security position once with a uh, 249. Okay. And then we're, we're about to assault the building, you know, and we knew two guys were in the, uh, in the compound or so we assault the compound. And so I put him on security position. He's the only guy covering an alley and his, uh, his rounds are just hanging off the 249 and they're not even loaded. So he's, he's the only guy covering that alley and he doesn't even have his weapon system loaded. Hmm. And it's like, come on, man. So you had that and then you had just crazy heroes that just wanted to get after it. So you had to just roll with what you got. Like, he's not my soldier. I can't do anything about it. All I can do is switch them out with somebody else and, and pay attention to everything they're doing. It's tough. It, and that's the challenge, most challenging part about being a Green Beret is you're not operating unilaterally. Huh. So Navy SEALs get to operate by themselves. They get to work with each other. You know, CAG. Delta Force gets to work with each other. Rangers, they get to work with each other. Green Berets, you get a group of people you've never met before and you get to go get in combat with them. And, and if they're good, you, that's awesome. And if they're not, sucks to be you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Sean, uh, I have one more question for you because you've gone to multiple combats. If I can ask you, you know, any three life lessons that you've learned from the battlefield which you'd like to share, any three? Uh... Life lessons from the battlefield. I think um, I think a lot of people don't think about the fact that their time is limited, and that is something that helps me to stay motivated and it helps me to appreciate life. Um, and the battlefield kind of it, it shoves that in your face that you could be gone like that. And mortality is something that is is we all have to face. But I think some of the most I don't think that's a morbid thing. I don't think that's a sad thing. I think people don't realize that it's powerful to understand that your time is limited. So do with it 
the, the most that you can, you know, when your time comes, be proud of what you put into it. And people that don't have never experienced anything really dangerous in their life, they don't really connect themselves to mortality. They don't want to think about it, which unfortunately think it, it makes them live a life that is almost like it's, they have a hundred years to, to accomplish something, or I'm sorry, two, maybe 200 years. Cause they're not getting after it. They're not pushing for anything. So I think war taught me, um, you know, to, to always accept, you know, that your time is limited, do the best with it that you can. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it taught me that not everybody, you know, we have a shirt that when I started my first company is uh, strive to be the best for those who no longer have the option. And so losing somebody, losing friends in combat, like they can't do it anymore. They can't, they can't, they don't get the, the ability to wake up and, and try new things, you know, it's over. So, um, you know, push yourself for the people that don't have the option. And then third, I don't know if I had to pick a third, I think um, the leadership aspect would be the biggest one is like when it, when truly matters, when a situation really gets bad, the structure of leadership goes away. Mm. So we can, the military has a ranking structure, you know, every, every company has a structure and it's easy to fall in line when I have to listen to this guy. I have to do this because that's my boss. But when things get dangerous, all those titles completely dissipate. And the only thing that matters is skill um, and a person's ability to stay calm under pressure. And that could be the lowest ranking person on the team, which rises to the level of the, you know, the best person in that moment. So to not get attached to, you know, structuring and ranking systems. You know, you never know when it, when the pressure is really on, who's going to be the best person standing in the room. And it could have nothing to do with their ranking in your, your system. Got it. Uh, so Sean, if you could also speak about, you know, FNG Academy, what do you do there? And what was your, you know, intention when you started on with that? Yes. Yeah, so the, the FNG Academy, when I got out and I, I, I love to say that like, oh, I was just, I wanted to help other people, but really it was kind of selfish because. Um, I wanted, when I got out of the police department, I wanted to, first of all, I missed the community. I missed the special operations community, but I needed something for me that was going to help focus on others. And like, because I have a lot of PTSD from my childhood and from war and from police department. Um, And the only thing that I found that like calmed me down was when somebody else was helped based on something that I did. It gave me so much satisfaction I, it made me feel a sense of purpose that I was longing for. Um, so I wanted to figure out how I can continue that and just make it better and, and grow, you know, cause it was personally helping me um, deal with a lot of issues that I've had. And then, so we started the YouTube channel. I wrote the book, uh, wrote my first book rising above. And then when people started telling me that my story was helping them, it, it just became a passion. And I was like, well, if I could help you with just what I've gone through, how many people can we help? And so then we started an online store. I reached out to two of my best friends. Um, so we, we hired a, one of my best friends, made him partner for, uh, to run the um, cinematography. So he does the YouTube channel. He's our videographer. He runs all that. Okay. And then we partnered, I partnered with another one of my best friends to run the store. So then we could bring all the gear, all the stuff that helped us get through selection. We could start selling that to uh, candidates and give them just a one-stop shop for everything they need to increase, improve their chances and increase their chances of getting selected. So our goal is within a, a few years to have every single person in the special operations community have gone through us in some way, shape, or form, whether it's um, a video that they watched, whether it's motivation, whether it's gear, um, or just, you know, mentorship, we're going to affect the next generation of special operations and increase our fighting force. So that way, if, if we ever needed to defend ourselves as a country, um, then we have the most amount of citizens that are highly trained and, and effective and things like that. So I really see it as kind of just helping give back to the special operations community, 
But then also those Green Berets, once they're done, they go into the workforce and then they make our society better too. That's correct. That's good. Uh, Sean, I have one question because I've read about you and your childhood and also the kind of operation that you go in. There's a lot of stress there. So how do you channelize this, you know, uh, the pain, the failures and the stress that you undertake and yet perform? So how, how do you channelize that? Well, I think probably for me personally, a lot of that came from my childhood because of all the stress. Uh, my childhood was nonstop stress. I was always, I always had that feeling in the pit of my stomach that I just like, I wanted to throw up from too much stress. And, and I had that since I was like eight years old. Um, you know, I got shot at the first time I was like, I was eight. And, uh, you know, I think my mom ripped somebody off and we were getting chased in a car and he shot at the car twice. And it, the round would have hit me in the chest because I was facing out of the back window, but it deflected down into the trunk of the car. My brother was in the seat next to me. Um, she's, so the stress level has always been there. And so I, I kind of just learned to cope with it as a kid, but then the military taught me how to channel it and kind of use it for something positive. Um, like with the idea of being war, like the, the preparation was always for war, for war, for war. But in reality, it's so much more than that. And I, I think that's why you could have special operations people that haven't seen war are still just as talented is because the training for that, that moment is still there, regardless if they went to war or not. They, they're taught how to analyze stress and anxiety. So for me, it's, it's coping, but also relying on training and trusting yourself and then just putting one foot in front of the other. Because the biggest issue anybody can have is pausing and freezing um, mm -hmm. in, in whether it's a business situation, whether it's a war situation or leadership, the worst thing you could do is not move forward. Because if someone moves forward in the wrong direction, they can be corrected. But somebody who doesn't move at all, there's nothing you can do about that. They're stuck. Got it. Uh, Sean, so my final question to you would be, you know, uh, as a special forces operator, what was your actually favorite weapon in combat? Oh, my M4. I, okay. I love I love the M4. Um, we had access to, I almost got to shoot a javelin in combat. We did a, a shot a javelin in training. Um, but I, I love my M4. That's my baby. And uh, I wouldn't switch that thing out for anything. I love, uh, I love a short barrel, 10 and a half inch barrel with a suppressor, a suppressor cover. Um, and to me, having a, you know, a red dot optic on it, keeping it simple. And I, I could do almost anything with that. We, and that's one thing, like we really push those M4s in training too. So it's, it's good to know how, just how far you could shoot with a 10 and a half inch barrel um, AR-15 platform. I mean, you can get easily 300 meters if you know the drops, if you practice with it, practice, you know, just really trying to reach out far and touch things with it. You, those things are way more capable than, than people can imagine. I love right. it. Got it, got it, Sean. Sean, thanks a lot uh, for your time on this interview. I hope, you know, a lot of people who will be watching on my audience will get a perspective about uh, how life as a Green Beret looks like. A lot of people will follow your channel and try to understand what you're putting up there. So thanks again for taking your time for us and sharing your story. Uh, thanks again, man. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I think it's really cool what you're doing. I, I don't think there's enough awareness. People don't realize all the special operations and all the other parts of the world. And there's so many cool special operations programs out there. And there's so many people doing really, really cool things and having really, really cool missions. So as soon as like, I don't do, I haven't been doing many podcasts lately, but when you asked, I was like, yes, because if you're going to start reaching all of those audiences, that's awesome. And we would like to do the same at one point too, because I would like to start getting out to these other countries and experiencing some of their special operations at some point, that would be a long-term goal for us because there's some real, real cool people out there doing some real awesome things. So I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, thanks Sean.